Hi, I'm Joe Heath. I'm Tony Heath. And this is the Watchathon of Rassilon. Is it? Sure. Today we're going to be talking about the fifth serial of the third season. Um, it's called The Ark. It consists of four episodes. The Steel Sky, The Plague, The Return, and uh, The Bomb. And that aired from March 5th, 1966 to March 26th, 1966. That's those a chill some, fact. Those were some chill facts. And uh, today we have returning for, what is this, your third time? I don't know. I've, I've lost count. It might be the third, might be fourth. I don't know. Technically, I'm in most episodes because I made the theme song. That is true. Right. So, like, I think the only episode, like, you're not in the first couple, maybe. This is Vincent E.L. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I am Vincent E.L. I made the theme song for this program. Hold on. I'm, I've he's frantically, got two, he's frantically going to our own website this is your fourth, to see how many episodes you've been on. This is your fourth appearance. You were previously on the Aztecs, the Space Museum, and Doctor Who and the Daleks. Cool. I remember being on at least one of those. So tell us, uh, what have you been up to since last we heard you? Oh, this is embarrassing. I've been up to nothing. No, I've been uh, I've been at work doing work, and I've not been doing much fun. Although I did for the holidays, I did spend some time with my family, and also I spent some time with the uh, Tomb Raider uh, <laughs> because of Humble Bundle. If we're going to to mention it now, would be the time that uh, tis the season. <laughs> Vince just sent us, and we just uh, opened his Chumbly remix. That we yeah. challenged him to make and um Really you're gonna spoil it for the audience and not be like a surprise at the end? Well it's your show. You can decide to do what you want through the magic of editing. Well we'll, we'll see if we if we set... But I feel like it's an update. Yeah. That in the meantime you worked on the Chumbly thing. Uh, not so much in the meantime as in the between episodes of watching for this episode. I actually did it today. Over the course of a couple of minutes, it was like quick throw together. It was nothing at all. But see, we we, we plug it here, it, but you can't listen to it until the end of the podcast. There you go. Don't skip ahead. We'll don't, know. Don't skip ahead. Yeah, you'll miss the best part, which is the part in between those parts. <laughs> the parts that are happening now. The part where we actually talk about the serial that we have watched, which is not missing. Yeah. Oh my god, I was so happy I cried. <laughs> We've been doing some... Missing ones, and not only that, but incredibly long. So long, weirdly paced, and non-existent, and it's been rough. Thank you for doing that for us, who don't have the patience to watch all of those. I watched some of the missing ones, but I skipped over the longest one. I may have watched a little bit of it. No, I think I skipped the whole thing. So I, so I listened to the podcast, and that gave me the gist of it. Pretty much. I've forgotten it by now because I forget everything, but I at least feel like when I was listening to the podcast, I got the feeling of watching the serial more than I would have from watching the reconstruction, probably. I'm glad we're, we're doing our part. Because I, I, hope, I hope ultimately that that's what the, the episodes, the reconstructions that we do are just like, I'm just going to listen to the podcast. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's going to be a bunch of that, I'm sure, especially for the longer ones. So thank you. You're you're providing a service to other impatient fans such as myself. Fantastic. We're gonna help you get through classic who. You should maybe have an image with a tagline on it somewhere. We help you get through classic who. It's a weird rhyme scheme. Well, it's a weird meter. <laughs> the rhyme scheme solid. solid. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joe. But it's like a charity that we do. <laughs> and uh, so far, we're only. I would probably only help Vince. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, uh, eventually I might find someone who's interested in hearing the fact that I have friends who have a podcast about Classic Who, who will then go and listen to it when I tell them. That's that's what we do. We we chari- we, 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 we charitize you. <laughs> I don't know what, the, the, don't know what the, the verb is for that. Not that. So, but yeah, we, 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 we put our charity on you, <laughs> and then we get you to pimp us out. 
So no, that's the plan. That's it's like you're paying it forward. All I don't right. Know. Maybe we should talk about the arc. What's the first episode in the arc? The first episode is survey says no. Nope. The steel sky. Is there a count of how many arcs are in the uh, the Doctor Who complete series? Because I feel like I feel like there's at least two other serials slash episodes that deal with arcs in space. There's the arc in space. Which I think is the name of a serial. I haven't seen it, but I'm guessing it has something to do with an arc in space. And there's dinosaurs on a spaceship, which is kind of also an arc in space. And there might be possibly another one, even another one in, in, in the n- new series. I'm not sure. Well, I don't really remember dinosaurs on a spaceship, except that they were dinosaurs on a spaceship. That's literally the only thing I remember. Yeah, they totally stole that idea from me. <laughs> from a comic book that we co-wrote that doesn't exist because we lost the artist he's not dead they <laughs> uh, were just complications he's um, not dead just complicated i don't know much about shada other than that dirk gently is largely based on shada but i know in dirk gently there is sort of an arc in space as well that the, the villain uh of the book sort of was part of a arc ship situation that was looking to like colonize like another planet but uh, i don't know if that's in shada or not and also that episode doesn't technically exist because they sort of scrapped it but it's been a while since i read it's been a while I knew you were going to say that um it has been some time since i read the book Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, but I did listen to the radio series just recently and i've already forgotten any reference to an arc <laughs> That's that's my memory for you. I remember very little, which is why why I take so many notes for these things. We were in a we were in a Dirt Gently radio series that's mentioned on the Dirt Gently Wikipedia page. Uh, that's is it? It is. Was that ever completed? I don't even remember recording a lot of lines for it. We did three episodes. Um, you were Dirt Gently, correct? I possibly was. Again, my memory <laughs> is not great. I was Michael Wenton Weeks and like some random secondary character. Um, and also Ray, previous guest Ray Friesen, is mentioned on the Dirt Gently Wikipedia page because he attempted, or he made like a Dirt Gently graphic novel and then was asked to take it off the internet. <laughs> so he's mentioned under Taken Down for Legal Reasons. <laughs> like three people on this podcast are mentioned on the Dirt Gently Wikipedia page, which was written by Douglas Adams, who was a writer for Doctor Who. So that's, we're, you know so we're much almost. About the Dirt Gently Wikipedia page. Like an awful lot. Well, I read it recently. <laughs> and I was like, hey, there's a thing I was in that is mentioned there. We have not talked about the arc. <laughs> no, I'm trying to steal your notes so I can be like, all right, how did anyway, this sucker start? Sorry for derailing this by asking the question of how many arcs have been on Doctor Who. And you derailing it by talking about Ch- Shada and Dirk Gently. I have stolen Joe's well, notes. Well, that's the reason I said this, because there might be an arc in it. And I'm now piloting this episode. The first image is a lizard. That gets stomped on the head by a bird. And then the tracking, the camera tracks to, to a humanoid creature with an eye in its mouth. Which is really, a really cool design and I like it a lot. Like, that whole shot's really cool. Like, the reveal of it. Yeah. Because you can't tell what you're looking at at first. And then when you, like, finally get up to the head of the creature, you're like, oh, what the hell? <laughs> it's a beetle with a, an eye in its mouth. What the hell is that? Well, not a beetle as in the insect, but as in the no, band. Oh, like, it's got yeah. nice hair. Yeah. <laughs> 60s mop hair. It's a mop top, yeah. And yeah, and, and he's got like this this uh, this eye thing in his mouth that he's manipulating probably with his tongue. That's what it looks like. It's That's a what ping it says pong on the, ball. the Wikipedia page. Is it a ping pong ball? It's a yeah. ping pong ball with, a, with probably a Sharpie <laughs> circle on it. And they're just moving it around with their tongues. <laughs> it looked a little bit bigger. It might be like half a ball, or is it is is it a is it a full ball? Uh, I don't know. I, don't know. I read some. The Wikipedia somewhere. page said it was a ping a ping pong ball operated by his tongue. Like I imagine they cut it in half and like you just shove it between your lips. It might know. be a little bit more complicated than that. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, it was an interesting idea for for cheaply doing a well a, a one eyed creature. I feel like I mean I know how like you can look at it and be like I know how that's done, but it, like it still it, looked like a creature. Yeah, I like I just sort of I would like tune out that it was that and just you know it just was the creature to me. It wasn't it's, just me looking at some dude's mouth and being like yeah, that's a guy's mouth. It's effectively tricky 
mm. in, in creating that illusion, I think. Yeah. At no point was like, did I think, oh, that's a dude with a... I mean, that, initially, I was like, that's a dude with a thing. But you get used to it, and then it just becomes a one-eyed creature that walks through a fake jungle, and the TARDIS shows up. And Dodo's and, and... in it! I'm start. I... I'm kind of, I'm getting excited about Dodo. Yeah. I think so, yeah. I think I'm going to like her. I I suspect she's another person who's not going to be around for very long. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, she's just we so rifle through him. weird. Yeah. But like delightfully weird. Like she's just wearing what is it like a knight? Yeah, it's some kind of medieval thing. And I was like, why are you wearing that? And she's like, because I do what I want. Like, that's pretty much her answer. And it's like, all right, then you do what you want. I will follow you. And she sneezes. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, your second serial with uh, the companion, the young female companion sneezing, because that also happened in the space museum. I do not remember that. Was I on that episode? <laughs> Or no, it wasn't Susan, it was Vicky. It was Vicky. Vicky sneezed, was trying not to sneeze, and they put the finger under her nose, but she sneezes anyway. All right! But it doesn't matter, because nobody hears her. Right. Because they're in some weird time zone thing. But the same thing happens to Dodo in this episode. Except, do people hear her? I don't remember. Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, she sneezes, and Steven steps out and berates her for wandering off. He's like, do not do that. Yeah. Yeah, he's, like, really mad. I don't know, it seemed unjustifiably mad, but I guess he was like... She just sort of waltzed out of the TARDIS and was like, we didn't even check to see if the air was breathable yet. Yeah, and she wasn't supposed to be on the TARDIS in the first place, was she? No, no. she just kind of wandered on. Yeah, I, I I watched the end of the previous episode and I thought it was amazing. She wanders on and they, like, take off. The reason why they take off very quickly is stupid. But there's a, Steven's like, you don't understand. We can never take you back home. And she's like, all right. <laughs> It's like, no, you can never see your family or friends again. She's like, I don't have any. But anyway, Steven's mad. Like, mm -hmm. you, we didn't even check or anything. And you just wandered out. And we could be anywhere. We're on an alien planet. And she's like, no, I'm pretty sure we're on Earth. Yeah, we're, we're just outside of London. And he's like... I've been here. This is this zoo. I've been to this zoo. Yeah. It's like, look, see, there are elephants. And there's an iguana. Now that I think about it, none of those animals should probably be, like, hanging out together. That's I, probably not great. <laughs> well, that that comes up later. Because the, do the doctor steps out and he says, she's probably right about the Earth part, and goes back into the TARDIS. <laughs> he just, like, steps out, oh, you're probably right that it's the Earth, and he goes back in. And then, monster hand. And then cut to a courtroom! Yay, courtrooms! I get so excited about court drama in space. I love it every time it happens. Court of the Monoids! I'm surprised that's not what this episode is called. Well, wasn't the mono the monoids are just sort of servants, slaves, basically. They're not very active at this point. But still, that would be the type of title they give this, even if they weren't, just because it sounds cool. The commander, the judge guy. He's the commander, but he's a judge. He's a commander in judge. Or that's how that's how court space works. Yes. Court space or space court. Yes. So he's the judge commander guy. And he does fantastic upper lip acting, like Admiral Mati sneer, like the guy from, do you know the guy from Star Wars who gets strangled by Darth Vader? Yeah. Yeah, that guy. I thought about his, his upper lip, like it was that kind of a sneer. And a little bit, um, what's his name? Jeff. No, it's... <laughs> The dude from uh, The Big Bang Theory. The guy who plays with Sheldon. What is his name? Sheldon Cooper. Cheldor. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm sure his his name is a an alien version <laughs> of the name of the character he plays on the show. Fun fact, he played an alien at home. Uh, Jim Parsons. Jim Parsons, yes. Uh, I thought about his, his, uh, when he gets, like, excitable, that, that kind of upper lip acting, too. Uh, the commander judge was, like, a cross between Admiral Motti and, and Jim Parsons, upper lip-wise. That's such a bizarre combination. Just the upper lip. The rest right. of him, straight up Matt Damon. No, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really remember. And some dude gets sentenced to the big house with, like, pim particles. No, the tiny house. It's so tiny. No, the big house. It's it's a Marvel reference. It's a prison where people get shrunken down by Ant-Man. That's the best. That's my favorite. That's where they put villains in the Marvel universe. At least some of them. They they put super villains in a... They make the villains small? They shrink them down and put them in a tiny prison. <laughs> that saves space. And also it's really cute. I was like, this this episode is playing tor towards Tony's... Yeah, studio. I was thinking that too. <laughs> Cause that was something I remembered. Yay! Vince remembered a thing. <laughs> so excited. Um, but yeah, they they, they find they, an elephant. 
An elephant. <laughs> Team Team Tart is not the court people. Yeah, we find the elephant guilty. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where the doctor points out that the animals and plants and stuff are from different countries and places. And, and also there's no sky and the ground is vibrating. If Ian were here, he'd declare it alive. He'd be like, the ground is alive. I literally thought that when we were watching it. I think he, he touched the ground and he was like, it's vibrating. And I went, I miss Ian. <laughs> Me too. And uh, uh, there is a sky, but it's it's a steel sky. No. The steel sky. No. The titular steel sky. <laughs> so D- Dodo stole the medieval clothes from the doctor's closet, and the doctor complains about it. Because it's not so fun when the shoe is on the other foot, is it, doctor? When other people are stealing your clothes. Then it's wrong. I then see how Then it's a bad is. thing. <laughs> I didn't think about that, but you're totally right. He's very mad at something that he does himself all, all the, the time. time. Like, consistently. And then the humans and the eye mouths, the, the uh, monoids, detect intruders, which are the Team TARDIS, and they are baffled. They're like, what? Intruders? Here? That's impossible. Intruders in your arc? It's more likely than you'd think. <laughs> <laughs> so Team TARDIS finds graffiti of a two-headed zebra. Uh, a Zaphod zebra. Which isn't important in any way. Yeah, like, what was, that was, that did nothing. Yeah, no, that was, that was, that, that comes back never. <laughs> yeah, there's no point for it. They are humans from Earth, so I don't know. Just some artist was bored. Yeah. And then an alarm goes off. The monoids said it are like fucking with the TARDIS. The TARDIS. And the alarm goes off. And Steve Steven says a line that I don't understand. If this is Earth, it's no longer inhabited by human beings. What is he basing that on? Where does that assumption come from? Is he trying to be Ian? Yeah, he, yeah. he also misses Ian. He's like, I'm just going to make some baseless assumptions because I miss Ian. Because somebody's got to do that on the show. Right. <laughs> and not only is his assum- like his assumption wrong, I mean, it's not Earth, but also the thing is inhabited by humans. Yeah, he's, he's wrong about every part of that. He's wrong about the if. He's wrong about this being Earth. He's wrong about it no longer being inhabited by human beings. I mean, I guess, I guess you could say that he's right about Earth no longer being inhabited by human beings because they're on the fucking ship. That so in fair. a way, <laughs> in a way, he's exactly right. Except he said, "If this is Earth, right?" He made it conditional. So it's just, it's just a nonsensical line of dialogue that leads nowhere. How does the doctor figure out that they're on a spaceship? Is it just the vibrating? I think they go like it's know. vibrating and there's a there's a steel Well, I think they feeling. get taken in they get taken in by the They haven't realized yet that they're on a ship because uh that happens later and I wrote it down and I haven't gotten to that part yet. Dodo's sneezing is becoming an issue. And they spot something in the distance. That's when the doctor figures out they're on a spaceship. He's like, "Look, there's stuff over there. We're on a spaceship." There's spaceship stuff in that direction. Slightly off camera. No, it's it's we, we actually get an establishing shot of it that is clearly a matte painting, but nonetheless, it's stuff in the distance, and it's unclear what it is. But I guess we'll take the doctor's word on it for it. He knows spaceships, so he would know that that stuff means spaceship. And then small children? No, not small children. The the monoids, but they look small in this shot for some reason. I don't know if it's the angle or what. I remember them being small in this shot. And I don't know why. I, they were like monoid babies. I remember turning to Tony and was like, is that children? <laughs> Are those toddlers in there? Yeah, and they never come back, the tiny ones. So I don't know if it's the shot or if it's just tiny monoids that we never see again. It's very strange. They hang out with the two-headed zebras. Yeah, that's probably where they went. But then where where do they go in episode four? When stuff happens, <clears throat> we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> like, did they, did they all? Anyway. So they show up, and Team Tardis gets brought to the place with all the monoids and humans for questioning. Uh, is this, the, this is the area where there's just people just standing around, just standing there for, like, the entire episode. Just, like, a yeah. chorus of humans that don't really do anything. They're just... And they're there forever. They're there to ever. judge other people. I think they're the jury of the court. But they're, they're even standing there, though, Oof. when, like, court stuff isn't happening. <laughs> They're always just hanging out there. The Other things happen, and they just and they're just standing there. Like you, you look in the background, and there's like children being very bored. The the judge forgot to to dismiss them. <laughs> <laughs> just have to stay. 
I noticed there's like one little girl just like she's just like playing with the edges of her like skirt thing because like they do nothing they just stand there <laughs> everybody huddle up there we didn't finish the set but yeah they get questioned yeah and it's it's a and it's a big exposition scene and the earth is on its last legs and the humans and monoids teamed up supposedly according to the humans but it's pretty clear that they've enslaved the monoids and they're not planning on going back to earth this is also an example of what is starting to become one of my favorite tropes i don't know who you guys are but i there's one person who completely trusts team tardis and is just delightful and loves them and there's another person who's like i don't know who these people are but they're probably evil (laughs) and we should maybe kill them or get rid of them or imprison them i don't know that seems to be the format yeah that definitely goes all the way back to vince's first episode the aztecs because like yeah that happened there too. Yeah, this seems to be what the what what the show is uh, based on around, around as a primary mechanism of of an episode. It's the format. It's part of going to a new place. There's always one guy who really likes you and one guy who really hates you. And it's big extremes where it's like one person is like, "I trust this person completely," and the other one is like, "These people need to die right now. <laughs> We're in a big hurry to kill these people." Oh, so the humans are planning to build a big human statue. And when they show the plans to Dodo, the alarm goes off again. And it's going to take 700 years to finish building. And the 700 years is how long it's going to take to get to the next planet they're going to on the Ark. That's which, convenient. I think this is the point where... They have timed that out nicely. <laughs> they made the, the, the size of the thing specifically so that it would take that long. We didn't bring a calendar. We planned it out so that it'll be done when we arrive and no sooner. We need something to do on the trip, man. If we finish early, then we won't have anything to do. We all can't hang out in the cabinet, the the the, the miniature we all cabinet. Can't be in the jury. Yeah, we can't just stand there all day. Some of us have to actually do something. I, mean, I think it's at some point during the expositiony stuff that Dodo names the ark. And she's like, "Oh, so it's like an ark," and everyone's like, a "What? You know, an ark?" And everyone's like, "All right." Yeah, it's like an arc then. And that becomes the thing they call it. Yeah, like way later. It's like Vicky and the Chumblies. Dodo is Vicky now. It's It seems uh, the companions are kind of interchangeable from the writing standpoint. I think they're making very small changes from, from one companion to the next. So it's like Steven is basically Ian, but with some very slight alterations. And Dodo is basically a cross between Vicky and Susan. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, function-wise, yeah. Yeah, Stephen ha- has fits the Ian role, but uh, has yeah different characteristics. He doesn't have like I know he doesn't have like the dad aspect. Yeah, he doesn't feel like so, like my scout leader like Ian does. Yeah, but it's it's like it's like a new version of the same character. Instead of doing character development, they replace a character with a character who's slightly different. Is I guess what I'm saying. So it's like inst- instead of instead of having events change the character, they just go, "Oh, this character isn't working out. We need a character who's kind of like this, but a-, a bit different in these regards, so that we can <laughs> utilize them better." It's like they're putting out version 2.0 of the same basic character, which is what they do with the Doctor too. Yeah, they're they're just putting out updates of the characters instead of doing character development. And and to be fair, this was kind of before character development was a thing in in series. Like that wasn't the thing that you did. When did that really become a thing? Like later. Like that's that's almost like something that ha- happened in the 90s. Like late 90s <laughs> when that started happening on like commonly. Like it might have happened on a few shows before that, but like that was when you start noticing that shows start doing that regularly, I think. It's so weird to think about that. I don't know, that there was just a time when no one thought to do anything like that? It's probably because, like, you have to be able to watch a show at any time. People didn't ju- couldn't just, like, stream them and get the right. DVDs. You just had to be able to turn on an episode and know what's going on. People didn't follow shows so much as they would watch an episode when it was on. Like, probably the only thing that had character development probably was soap operas probably because that's something people tuned into i was gonna say i know at least some of the the soap operas that i cut and stuff definitely do but that was something you'd watch a lot so like you you'd want that was more you know something you'd like keep tuning into keep up with because that was like what they were designed for they were designed only for, for keeping you tuning in with, with very little regard for telling stories. It's just yeah. interesting to me how, like, 
the ideas you have of what a story should be and how that shapes mm -hmm. the stories that you tell. And it's like, ah, oh, we've never considered just sort of changing this character or having them grow. Maybe we should try that. I guess at this time they wanted everybody to be pretty much what they are so that when people tuned in again, they would be like, oh yeah, that's that guy. <laughs> they wouldn't be like, why is he suddenly a dick? Or whatever, you know? Or suddenly not a dick. Why is this person now a main character? <laughs> and why is he like a rogue demon hunter? <laughs> and not just a big goofball. Aww. So, uh, not, a, not unexpectedly, Dodo's sickness is spreading and doing damage to the monoids and apparently the judge. Yes. yes the judge slash commander has a fever. And these people, I think it, it's kind of quickly established, have like, They've been in humans for so long that it's like they've never experienced a common cold. Yeah, because that's a thing of the past. Like, they've they've basically done away with it. They're, they don't have an immune system that knows what the fuck it is. Which is something that I've always thought about when watching, like, sci-fi, like Doctor Who and Farscape, where I'm like, what if you just got, like, an alien flu and, you know, it killed you? That doesn't sound fun. Yeah, and it doesn't it doesn't sound like a great movie. Which is why you have movies like Alien that are basically that, but a lot more dramatic. But, I mean, it doesn't make for fun, like, space travel. I mean, it's like, all right, we're going to go to this alien planet, but be careful and make sure you don't get, I don't know, space plague. But then the, the question is also if the biology is, is compatible on the, on the microbial level or whatever. Like, like if, if, if a, uh, like a, a virus or, or a, something else could could harm you if it's not familiar with your biology. I mean, it it doesn't have to be familiar with your biology, as in it took fucking classes for it. But like, <laughs> <laughs> like it wouldn't be. But would it be compatible if it evolved under completely different circumstances? It's gotta function with the same proteins and shit. Yeah. It might not be looking for the same stuff. But these are both humans. Yeah, exactly. So it should be pretty obvious that if you've got a fucking cold, maybe don't be hanging around future people i mean to be fair i'm not sure how much is obvious to dodo like at all well it isn't but th but to the doctor it should be yes which is right. I, something he says he's called the doctor but he's not a doctor of medicine which is uh, a, a conversation that's basic that basically happens as dodo's like how the hell am i supposed to know i don't know what's going on here i just showed up but they're all and like the doctor's like no yeah i, I totally should have known that this is a dumb situation to be in. But they're all like, eh, it's just the cold. It should be fine. And then a monoid drops dead. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And then they get arrested. And they're like, well, fuck. And that's the end of the episode. That's, that's the end. That's the end of episode one. And we are now on to episode two. The Plague. The Plagueway. The Plaguey. Which is a really frustrating episode for me. Just because most of it spent like, all right, well, we've arrested you because you brought this, this disease here. And the doctor pretty much says, because the, the, the monoid gets sick at first, and then the commander gets sick, and they don't really know what's going on, and the doctor's like, oh, I bet it's Dodo's cold. And they're like, oh, okay, so it was you. Arrest them. Then it's like, a couple people are like, well, they're the only people who can, like, help us? Like, they're the only people who know anything about it? Maybe we should let them try and find, like, a cure? That's like the end of the episode. <laughs> well, I feel like it's a good chunk of it, isn't it? Of just people going back and forth. But first, they get stuck in a cell. With no sonic screwdriver. Because that doesn't exist yet. Why do you have a note that says Mad Max Masses? I have a Mad Max reference in my notes, but we'll get to that. Mad Max Masks. Masks. Oh, okay. That makes more sense. My Mad Max reference is completely different. We'll get to it. <laughs> so they're stuck in a cell, and the humans who are called the Guardians, right? Sure. Yeah, they're... The humans that are awake, which I don't know if we mentioned, like, they made they made that one guy small, but they, like, reduced him to a cellular level, is that kind of... They put him in a, uh, they, they shrink him and they put him in a cabinet. That's what happened. Right, so, like, there's more humans on the ship than are, like, actually there. There's a bunch of, like, there's a bunch of ones in, like, petri dishes and drawers, basically. Yeah, they've got them in storage. Freeze-dried humans. Yeah. Presumably animals, too, I, I, I'd imagine. I guess. But the, the ones who are there and awake are the guardians. Everyone else is just the rest of humanity. They're guarding the Petri dishes. They watch monoids die on monitors, and they're worried about what might happen to humans. Which, again, seems to uh, reinforce this, this thing that the, the humans only really care about the humans. They don't care about the monoids, really, other than being an indication of what might happen to the humans. Oh, you know what is cool about the monoids? That they seem to uh, communicate with a kind of sign language. 
Oh, yeah. Only it seems like not a whole lot of thought went into it. <laughs> Because you see, like, the same, like, four hand wavy motions over and over again. And I was like, that was kind of cool. Well, it's very subtle. It's a very subtle sign language. <laughs> the differences are, are too small for this low video quality to... <laughs> it's all about which direction your, your uh, mouth ball is looking. <laughs> I just really liked it because I don't think I've ever... I don't think I've ever really seen any sign language in, like, a sci-fi... Setting. I have in a recent episode of Doctor Who, but that was humans. Really? Yeah, in a very recent episode, there there was a deaf person. That's awesome. So there was there was plenty of sign language in that episode. Was it subtitled? I don't think so. But I mean, it was it was a sign language interpreter and a deaf person. So there was there was talking, but it was a lot of delay, and they played with that sort of the delay of of communication and and stuff and and like it it was essential to the plot but it wasn't sort of exploitive it was it was very well handled i thought my mad max reference i think is right here which is that the doctors are looking in on the commander and they have these like big masks on that have tubes on it so i guess they don't breathe in sickness sick air i just thought it looked like the mad ma mad max masks <laughs> mad mad masks max 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 Mad Max mask. So the judge seems pretty convinced that he's going to die. So he does he does some deathbed acting his ass off just in case. Continue he's, the voyage. He's the best. You he must. is super hammy, and I love it because he spends like most of the episode in bed being sick and dying, but also like he's watching the doctor's court thing going on and like shouting at the TV. And then they unceremoniously send uh, uh, Spock's body off into space. Wait, who was in that? I just, they just shot some dude off into space. That was the dead monoid. That was the, the first dead monoid. monoid. Okay. Because I was like, I know we're having a funeral. I don't know who for. <laughs> it was a little bit confusing for a moment, but then it sort of became clear when they showed the commander again that it wasn't him. I, I thought it was him for a second, too, and I was like, no, he's still alive. They, yeah, they dead. shoot him off into space, and they're like, all right, let's go to court. And there was no ceremony, and I, I guess they, they know about the Genesis planet. That's a Star Trek reference. So the, the team TARDIS goes on trial, accused of chemical warfare, essential. E. My note says, let's have a court. And Steven's face is very shiny. <laughs> really shiny did dodo sneeze right at him on him yeah so it's snot it's supposed to be snot the like vaseline that is just caked on his face i think yeah, it's just, it's just he's got a fever no it's boogers so it's it's sweat no it's boogers it is, it's, <laughs> aren't shiny uh if you do it right i don't well it it kind of depends on your health i guess i mean snot can be shiny well, boogers are boogers this conversation is stupid <laughs> Wait, I did not know there was a difference between snot and boogers. So boogers are like like the gooey, clumpy kind. Yeah. And snot is the like more viscous, liquidy. Obviously. Okay. Okay. Well, if you sneeze, you're not sneezing out boogers. I thought snoz, snot was an uh, umbrella term for all of the mucus variants, uh, but boogers was specifically solid or semi-solid. See, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> I think, I think mucus, mucus is covers your, everything. Yeah, mucus is your umbrella term. But snot is the more liquid, like, sort of gooey, yes. and boogers are goopy. But, I mean, snot can be of different uh, thickness, right? Oh, yeah, sure. Like, you can have thick snot. Like, thick, yellow, Ugh. greenish. Ugh. We've said snot too many times. I'm gonna... <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but I, I think there's... There, I think... I think boogers are more dry. Ugh. Snot is always going to have at least a little bit of moistness right. to it. You okay. Know? okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the accuser's acting is also very special. He smiles with joy as he shouts in anger, <laughs> which I think is very a very interesting acting choice. Like, he's just really happy to be on television, I think. He's really angry, and he's shouting, and you can see a smile on his face as he's doing it. It's like... And it's not like a sinister smile. It's like, I'm happy to be here smile. Probably is. He's probably just so happy to be there. He thinks that Team TARDIS has knowledge of Refusus, which is the planet they're headed to, right? Uh, Yeah, it's called Refusus, and I don't think that was a good name for the planet. <laughs> yeah, I refuse to acknowledge that terrible name. <sighs> <laughs> What? <laughs> so, 
Then what happens? But of course they don't have knowledge of refuses. And the crowd, the the jury people, the I don't know if they're supposed to be just bystanders or a, a jury or both. Yeah, because they just get very shouty. Yeah, and they they seem to take the accuser's side mostly. But there's one guy who might be a defense attorney who believes Stephen's claim of accident and further suggests that the team might be the only ones who can cure the fever. That's when that comes up. The commander, who's still on his almost deathbed, is like, good point. <laughs> He's like, yeah, they're the only ones who can help us. Yeah, listen to them. But he's still on his deathbed, and I'm not sure if he's judging this trial. He's not, but it's very frustrating because it's like, what well, can just... He represents the viewer at home. But just then, breaking news, human death. And the accuser guy is like, this renders the defense irrelevant for some reason. Human lives matter more, I guess. Nobody's going to be like, monoid lives matter. All lives matter. One would think curing the fever might matter, but this guy is like, nope, well, you're completely wrong. I just write poetry to throw my mean, callous, heartless exterior into sharp relief. I'm going to throw you off the ship anyway. Guard, take the prisoners to the number three airlock and throw them out. Resistance is useless. And that's when Stephen passes out. And is thrown back in the cell. Which makes sense because he's kind of, he's not as future as everyone else. He's some future. He's some future in relation to Dodo. He's relatively future, but relatively past in relation to the... To the place we're at now. Uh, so he collapses and he's thrown back in the cell. And the doctor pleads for the lives of himself and his companions, but his pleas are ignored. The defense guy continues to argue, even though the trial is over, and he is also ignored. Uh, the commander judge, deathbed guy, uh, orders that Team Tardis be given access to research facilities or something. And he says, no expulsion. And the doctor immediately starts ordering people around. <laughs> and they're going to use uh, Steven as a guinea pig. Yeah, he gets lifted onto the table. And Dodo goes to the TARDIS for supplies. Yeah. But they're like, We're gonna, you're going to use Steven, because if you fuck it up, who cares? <laughs> But if you do it good, yay. But you got to test it out on him first. Not you're gonna test it out on our humans. Yeah. So the the humans talk about getting samples from animals. Oh, we need two. Obvious no reference as it cuts to a weird micro montage of monoids and animals. Awkward editing. Like this was the shortest montage ever. It was like two shots, three maybe. I remember being like, "Whoa, that was quick." What is this? Is weird. I need one lizard. And I need... One elephant and a test tube. <laughs> Those are the only animals we had. <laughs> the doctor does science. Actual doctor stuff that doctors do. Yeah, he's got the thing that uh, doesn't require needles. It's just, it's a sticky, it's a sticky note that you <laughs> apply to the people. It's a band-aid. He tested on Steven and he walks away before seeing the results so he can give the cure to the others. He's like, yeah, I'm not going to wait around. I'm, I know this works. I've, I've tested it, technically. <laughs> I don't care about the results. The point is the test. <laughs> but it's okay because Stephen Stephen gets better. Did Stephen get hit so hard by the the by the sickness because he's also from the future compared to Dodo? Like, is is he past the cure? But yes. <laughs> I saying, that's kind of what I thought. Is that part of the reason why? Like, for Dodo, just has like the sniffles. Yeah, and it like knocks Stephen out. Maybe also they just are like. Oh, crap. We forgot that it's the common cold, but we've already, like, knocked Steven on his ass. Oh, well. No one's gonna remember. But he is, he is... He's from the future. In the future. Yeah. So he might... His immune system might be like, oh, wait, I think I remember this one. No, 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 can't. <laughs> <laughs> don't, no, don't know. This seems either like like the writers weren't thinking or like they were really thinking, right? It's one of those things where it's like, were the writers accidentally doing something really smart here let's give them let's give them the benefit of the doubt yeah. So yeah yeah they did it on purpose right good I job so. writing team yeah good job that and they were subtle about it because because we're sitting here decades later not entirely sure if they meant it <laughs> dodo reports that steven and the judge commander guy 
are both getting better. And then the episode ends abruptly. The end! Oh, no. Everything's better! No, there's a big <laughs> smoking ball outside. Which is supposed to be the Earth. What? I did not know that! That was supposed yeah. to be the Earth? Yeah. I was like, did we just watch a melon get shot in the space? I was like, what is that smoking ball where the smoke behaves in a way that makes not even the slightest bit of sense in space? Uh, we too did not have any idea, but I was reading the Wikipedia earlier. That is supposed to be the Earth. So the Earth was on fire? That's why they were leaving, right? The Earth yeah. was going to explode. Or was it going to explode or crash into the sun or whatever catastrophic thing the earth does this this time it was it was just the weirdest thing where it's like cut to on on the um, on the scanner 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 <laughs> scanner, <laughs> scanner monitor it's it's a cross between a scanner and a janitor scanator janitor is by the way a cross between janet and skeletor <laughs> <laughs> so there's a big smoking ball outside to worry about the gang gets wheeled off to the tardis and they leave. That's a really not wait, wait, that's a really nice shot, I wanna say. That's a pretty decent effect because the monoid drives his little go his little golf cart with the uh the TARDIS team on, and then they get off, get in the, the TARDIS, and the TARDIS disappears, and then he backs out. That monoid probably had to sit there like while they moved the TARDIS set and like not move so that they could do the transition. I don't know. It was really there was it was pretty seamless spe- uh, special effect. Like, it's very subtle, so you don't even really pay attention to it. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, then it's split screen. Well, they get... They've acquired a switcher at this point, I've noticed. Oh, wait, so so you're saying the, the TARDIS faded in while the, the cart was still moving? Well, the cart was still in front of it, yeah. And then he backs out. Because the camera moves, it follows the cart, stops, uh, Team TARDIS gets off the cart, goes into the TARDIS, the TARDIS disappears, and then the cart backs out. But the cart stopped in front of the TARDIS. Huh, I'm going to have to go back and look at that later. <laughs> I think the monoid basically had to sit there, not moving, while they took the TARDIS off the set, and then, then he backed out. Being a person who edits shit that nobody notices, that's something I noticed. <laughs> so yeah, I like that. Uh, anyway, yeah, it's not important story-wise. I was just so in the show that I wasn't paying attention to the stuff like that. But that's a good thing, like, that you don't notice it, because normally... You do. <laughs> I I would no- notice stuff like that normally because uh, I went to film classes. So what happens then? Yeah, they return to the same place, but it's it's mysteriously empty, <gasps> which happens a lot. They go someplace and it's mysteriously empty, and, and the statue is finished, except the head is monoidish. Ask. Bum bum sort of. bum. It doesn't have really nice hair, though, which I thought was kind of a bummer. Yeah, no, I guess that was hard to sculpt. It's a, it's a small monoid head. And that is the end of The Plague, episode two. We are now into episode three, The Return, which I want to say right off the bat here that... <sighs> That's not a great title? Well, yeah, but uh, <laughs> no, I was going to say, this serial plays like a nice two-parter, because the first two episodes are like... The first part and the second two episodes are like the second part, like of a like a more modern day Doctor Who, and I feel that works pace wise nicely. And it like I actually like the way this serial is split up into sort of before and after. It's kind of nice. I really like that. So we are now kind of in the 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 second part of a two parter, even though this is a four parter. <laughs> so we are seven hundred years later. Well, I guess it's le- is it less than I guess it'd be less. I mean, than they just say seven hundred. Seven hundred ish. Maybe it's. 699. Because, like, how long have they been... How long have they been in the ship in the, the beginning? And how long have they been building the statue? Like, Well, they're they're about to arrive, so it's about 700, right? Yeah. Well, it's not that it's going to take them 700 years from beginning to end. It's We'll get there. From that point on. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are 700 years away. Yeah, so the, the, the statue, most likely a small sculpture against a very obvious matte painting, looks big in the shot. They've They've managed to make this thing look pretty big which is cool in fact at no point did i did i even think about it there's only anything but a large giant sculpture well there's one point where i i i looked at it as like oh it's no longer big but that's way later <laughs> we'll we'll get to there yeah but in in this particular shot like you get the sense that oh they're they, this is a shot where they've managed to make this statue look big Without really using forced perspective or anything, you're just looking at, I guess, a, like a, a, a small uh, sculpture against a matte painting, like a, a very obvious matte painting, and it feels like you're looking at a large statue against a large matte painting. <laughs> I guess it's probably because it's been made with small tools or something, like the statue. 
I don't know, but it it just it just looks big. Yeah. yeah. And then there's that nice shot, like from the statue's point of view, looking down. I like that shot too. And Dodo still doesn't grasp even the basic concept of time travel, even though they've spent all this time in the future. Dodo does not understand at all the idea that that they might have traveled through time again. I think much to the annoyance of the doctor too. Yeah, the doctor and Stephen are like, it's been about seven hundred years, obviously. But Dota's like, no, it's been seconds. It's like, the Stop statue wasn't done, now it's done. It was going to take seven. Come on, get there. Put you can two do and it. two together to get 700 years. Yeah, Dodo's being very sort of slow to catch on to the idea of time travel. I guess Dodo doesn't read science fiction. She doesn't watch Doctor Who. Well, obviously. She's not Deadpool. The ship is now on autopilot. As they discover. It's no one we, is buying the ship. We have human servants. Yeah, they, they find the video feed, the security cameras or something, something like that, of humans serving monoids. The roles have been reversed. <sighs> bum, bum, bum. This is a cautionary tale about slavery. Don't enslave people. You might become a slave yourself. I think that's what you're supposed to take from it. Don't set a bad example with regard to slavery. Maybe be nice, and maybe they'll be nice back. Yeah, but I, I don't know how I feel about, like, the slaves are now, like... The slavers? Guys. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a very it's a very problematic concept. It's very, it's very much playing into the f- fear. And also, like, to be fair, not all of the Monoids, spoilers, not all of the Monoids turn out to be evil. Like, there's some morally gray ones. <laughs> like, there's some that are like, this is bad, you guys. Maybe we should be peaceful, but that's that's just a little spoiler. So it, it's it's not as bad as it could have been. It could have just been, monoids are completely evil now, but they're not. So for a moment, it seemed like they were setting up that these are not quite monoids, but mo- monoid descendant life forms, but they're just monoids. But they have necklaces now, little cheap cardboard necklaces. <laughs> With numbers on. I, I, I get the sense that the monoids were kind of uh, the inspiration for the Ood. Well, I mean, the Sensorites were, I think, more. Were also, yeah. But I think the monoids were... They also had the, uh, the, the, the sashes with numbers, and now... And then they had the little, like, discs. That they put to their forehead. They, yeah. But yeah, but the monoids... The monoids are kind of very Sensorite-esque with their... Their I have to say it's probably... numbered sashes, but yeah, they have the 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 and okay, it's inconsistent though because they touch it to talk, but sometimes they're not touching it to talk. Yeah, sometimes they're just like it's like the comms in Farscape. I will say it is kind of shitty that it's like I said, the monads can't talk; they they communicate through sign language with the people, and then when it's like they're in charge now, they're in charge now because we they built collars so that they could speak. That's sort of shitty. <laughs> I mean, it also is like you know. A story thing it makes it much easier for a character to do things when they can well I, what what happened was that the humans made or developed the 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 technology or, or they made them do it i don't know for the for the collars and the guns and then the monoids used those things to rise up against the humans so it's basically the same concept as you know the the idea of uh, building robots who then turn against humans it's basically the terminator we're actually going to get to something that continued to confuse me throughout the serial because we see like a monoid from the back drinking a drink and he sets it down <laughs> How the what? Where does the liquid go? Where does it go? Yeah, I've I've I was wondering for, through the entire thing. How do they eat and drink? Like they don't have mouths that we can see. They have eyes, but they're clearly maybe it's under their hair. <laughs> their mouth is under their hair. That, that yeah. could be it. Or maybe it just goes around the eyeball. <sighs> Let's say it's under their hair. <laughs> Because there's multiple times that we see them eating and drinking, but we never see them, like, they just set the food or drink down. You don't actually see them. Because they probably like, oh shit, that was in the script, but but they have no mouth. <laughs> Their mouth is full of eyeballs. But they literally can't do that. I It could have been like in, we just watched the Star Wars Holiday Special, and there's this guy that pours oh, a drink at the top of his head. Maybe it's like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I actually rewatched that recently, too. Why would you rewatch yeah, that? Yeah, what? What's wrong? Because it's been a while. It's been a while. And I was uh, hanging out in a in a uh, video chat room, and I was playing some riff track stuff. I guess that's excusable. No. At least you're not <laughs> so just like. Not. I mean, you're sharing the the riff tracks with people. It's not like you're like, hey, I'm in the mood for some Star Wars no, holiday because special. I watched it with you with riff tracks, and I was like, why are we watching this? 
They take Team TARDIS to the to the leader. And Stephen says the TARDIS made the decision to return. And the revolution happened after the fe- fever virus mutated. And the humans developed speech synthesizers and weapons for the monoids, which they used to turn against their masters. I, my question was, I couldn't remember exactly what happened. Like, I know the fever played into, like, the revolution and all that. I couldn't remember why. Like, it was... The common cold mutates all the time. That's that's just a fact of reality. It's it's a thing it does. That's why people keep getting it over and over again because it keeps mutating and sort of putting on a different hat and sneaking in the back with a fake mustache and it's two two guys in one coat kind of situation. <laughs> they just get in two on top of each other and they have a fake ID and they get in the back. So like it mutated and like humans still got it and I guess monoids didn't die of it anymore is that I guess that they adapted probably they might have a better immune system that like just caught on and went oh this thing again I see what you're doing you're just two kids in a overcoat <laughs> the thing about the humans developing these technologies for the monoids and giving them weapons like were the humans like completely stupid like why would you give weapons to slaves well like they don't even have any like at all and they didn't have weapons before and they don't have weapons now yeah and they walk amongst them like if if you look at the 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 romans they had slaves that they gave weapons to and they called them gladiators they locked them up and they bossed them around with bigger weapons it was a whole thing to make sure that they don't rise up and kill them all I'm I'm not I'm not trying to give advice to slave owners but that's right. fucking stupid to give guns when you're unarmed give guns to the people you are oppressing I think it's something that the monoids kind of point out they're like yeah the humans were dumb they basically <laughs> deserve everything that they get they deserve to be our slaves cuz they did not see this coming The leader has the gang taken to the security kitchen and calls the Grand Council. Security kitchen is a fantastic <laughs> combination of words. The security kitchen. What is a security kitchen? It's a kitchen that's secure. It's a kitchen that secures things. But I mean, it's not. Are though. they cooking up security? No, they're cooking food. It's literally a kitchen that's, you know, they can't leave. Is it, is it, is it called a security kitchen because it's basically a, a prison cell? Yeah, probably. And like, prison kitchen wasn't as catchy? <laughs> Because it's like a security prison, but it's a security kitchen? Is that the play on words that they're trying to get to? But something happens there that I'm really excited to talk about because it's sort of like... The potatoes? No. <laughs> no, but yes. No, but... Can I, let me get to All my right, thing okay. first. All right, okay, but then we're going to talk about potatoes. Okay, Wait, but Wait, before this... that. <laughs> before you even get to... The security kitchen, there's a line. The leader of the, the monoids. I don't remember if, if the leader is monoid one or if they are two different characters. It's one. Okay, so it's monoid one. Says, says to Maharis, who is his, uh, his personal servant, I guess. He says, I trust that their return won't give you any ideas. Wink, wink. Apparently, if you want to avoid the risk of people getting ideas, the best thing to do is to give them ideas. This whole thing with the humans being stupid, it goes both ways. Apparently the monoids are also stupid in kind of the same way, in that they're basically arming the people they're oppressing. They're going, hey, don't get any ideas. Here's an idea. Don't get any ideas. And it is ultimately their downfall. It's just the monoids like over and over again going like, the humans won't, won't revolt. They're, they're too stupid. They can't do it. They're not as great as us. We're the best. Like, over and over again, it's like, hey, this rebellion's probably gonna happen. And the monoids are like, nah. Joe, you look like you're gonna explode. Well, there's a thing I've been wanting to talk about, and we can't get to it. Because <laughs> we haven't gotten there yet. We are there now. We're there now. We're <laughs> are we in the kitchen? We're in the kitchen. <laughs> what and happens in the kitchen, there's Joe? There's two characters. I really want you they're gossiping. to tell us. Yes, they're talking what's about happening. the legend of the doctor. And this is, I feel, is our first time that that sort of thing has happened, where the Doctor is basically part of a legend, and they they use they, they use the Ark that Dodo named, and they're talking about all the stuff that happened seven hundred years ago, and it's but it's not like a legend that the Doctor is involved in, and I feel like that's possibly the first time that has happened in Doctor Who, but it is a thing that happens a lot. Yeah, that's that's 
kind of become a staple of the show, at least recently. And this is like the first instance of that. They refer to Dodo and Stephen as a young couple. It's like the Doctor and a young couple in their in their I, mythology. And both Tony and I went, ugh. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, isn't Dodo like really young? I have no idea. It's hard to tell. She but- could be 16, she could be 20. And anywhere in between. And how old is Steven? 38. I mean, he's technically younger. He's relatively younger. Y- younger is already a relative concept. <laughs> <laughs> this is literally how it works. So what happens next? Talk about your damn potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> the potatoes are not yet. <laughs> how in space is totally an expression now. Yes. Yeah. I like how that. How in space. I kind of like that. Because they wouldn't say hell on Earth. They would say hell in space. Because they've never lived on Earth. They've only ever been in space. Yeah, how in space. Or how in the spaceship. How in the how ark. How on ark. But he said how in space. And I thought that was adorable. Just from like, a writer in the 60s was like, hee hee I just wrote a character saying how in space. <laughs> Uh, so Steven declares the top priority should be to find a way out of the security kitchen. What? Yeah. Oh, wait. We do have something before pill potatoes. The monoids plan to take refuses. They're going to send a party to scout ahead. Which is setting up my favorite bit in the entire serial, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah, and and they, they plan to take refuses for themselves, and they plan to eliminate the humans and all record of having been their servants. And the leader, Monoid One, I guess, says he's sending a landing party ahead. And potatoes are now made instantly by dropping a small object into a vat of liquid. And then doing a fade over it. (laughs) Yeah, like a really quick fade. And there you have peeled potatoes. And clearly not like automatically peeled potatoes. You can see that they've been peeled by a potato peeler handled by a living human being who has peeled them. Because they're unevenly peeled. (laughs) They're not smooth. Okay, but maybe... They're authentic. It's the... It's the miniaturization thing. So they peeled them, then miniaturized them. And so when they unminiaturized them by putting them in water. So they peeled billions upon billions upon billions of potatoes before they left Earth? Is that what you're saying? And then shrank them and stored them. (laughs) Because remember, they've been flying through space for 700 years. Maybe they were peeling potatoes on the ship. No, someone that, peeled the, 700 they, years worth of potatoes before they left. They clearly have, like, vegetation on the ship. Yeah, but why did they have to shrink them down if they, like, can't they just peel new ones? To preserve them. Why would they need to preserve them if they're constantly making new ones? They grew them and they're like, we don't need these right now. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not buying this. They peeled all the potatoes on planet Earth, packed them up, and <laughs> left. They brought every single potato on the planet. And they, of course, before the the end of the Earth, they made sure, of course, to make as many potatoes as they could possibly fit under the Earth's surface all over the planet. Just plant potatoes all over the place so that they can peel them all and shrink them down and put them on the ark. Makes sense to me. Okay, moving on. It makes about as much sense as an ark. (sighs) (laughs) <laughs> so more planning planning scenes i kind of zoned out they try to overtake a monoid but fail so who cares yeah then an armed monoid steps in and gets jumped then a couple more monoids step in and kill one of the humans and take the doctor and dodo to be in the landing party that right. scene made me so mad because it was like three of them trying to take his gun and the thing wouldn't let go so i have another thought about the arming of the uh, monoids. So the humans armed the monoids, right? Yes. Yeah. Against what? Potatoes? The ele- Unpeeled potatoes? The elephant, the elephant went mad. It was the elephant in the room. They like, had hey, to stop the elephant. You know what would let us peel these billions of potatoes <laughs> faster? Fire guns. Just a thought. Okay. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, why are they taking the do- Doctor and Dodo into the party? They want to... Sound it out. <laughs> <laughs> they want to make sure not to send a, a bunch of people they can't they, that they can't replace. Because they don't know there are life forms on this planet. They know that, but they don't know what's up with them. Yeah, they don't, they don't know that it's safe, so they're sending people they don't care about which includes one monoid monoid number two it's just like the 
second highest. Like, if you're going to send a bunch of people you don't care about, send, like, five at least. Are the numbers ranking, is that what the numbers are? Or is it just number one is the leader and the rest are just the rest? Oh, I don't know. I just assumed that they were ranking. Like, I, why else do you put numbers on collars? To keep track of which one is which. To be like, I'm number one. Wow, that's racist. Like, if you're four, I feel like you're like, yeah, I'm four. Five sucks. Even if that even if that wasn't the point in the first place. So there's there's no equality between any like there's no two equally ranked monoids. So there's no equality at all in that society between anyone. I mean probably like all of like once you get down to like all the thirties. <laughs> just like, well, those are the thirties. They're a little bit better than the forties, but I kind of assumed it was just number one is the top one and the rest are just the rest and they're all equal but like how do you decide like is it just is it like a chronological thing where it's like you're the 38th monoid to exist well to get numbered like they just lined up and they just gave them numbers or maybe they were already numbered by birth or whatever i don't know this is a thought that did not occur to me i just automatically assumed that it was rank because for the most part of it i wasn't even paying attention to the numbers and then later on i was like oh right they have numbers on their collars oh number number one i guess that's maybe the leader guy <laughs> like i was not entirely paying attention because it did seem one, two, and three were kind of like making decisions. Yeah. Did number two volunteer to be in the landing party? Because that might have been the case. That number two was like, oh, fuck it, I'll do it. <laughs> Here, let me have a couple of shitty humans. I mean, I know they wanted to. They wanted someone to like look over the humans and make sure it was all going to go okay. Yeah, I guess somebody had to oversee them. If you sent number like 66, he might be like, I'm, I'm not doing great here anyway. Yeah, I might as well turn against the leaders. I guess it was just some sort of plan thing. So they get in their little their little ship. So which which ones are these? It's it's the Doctor, it's Dodo, and it's D- Dasuk. Is it Dasuk or Dasuk? <laughs> it's the no suck. Idea. Da suck. Okay, so it's it's the Doctor, Dodo, and Dasuk. Three Ds and Mono number two. Dos. <laughs> Do it. The deuce. The deuce. Okay. Dr. Dodo, the suck, and the deuce. Get in that little ship and head towards Refusus. And the, the, the shot where the pod comes out of the ship and moves toward the planet, that shot made me think, this was a lot faster in Star Wars when C-3PO and R2-D2 went to Tatooine in an escape pod. <laughs> like, it was, it was kind of the same thing, but a lot slower. Also, I was like, hey, they're moving that prop towards the other prop. <laughs> yeah, and it was really shaky. And the doctor sells that because he looks super space sick. Which is really weird, because how does it shake if it's in space? Base. Like, it should just smoothly move, shouldn't it? I don't know. It lands decently enough, all upright and shit. That's when they turn on the landing gear. They get out of the ship, and then something gets into the ship. Well, the pod seems to do some stuff on its own. The implications are obvious. Yeah, the, it's an invisible... There's Again. an ass indentation <laughs> in the seat. A what? An ass indentation. Ass, ass indentation <laughs> in the seat. So I I presume the seat just didn't just, just didn't deflate somebody that is not visible sat there because Doctor Who likes to go for the invisible things because it's cheap and easy. <laughs> Although making an ass indentation in a seat is probably a little bit complicated. Yeah, that's, that's true. someone lovingly crafted that ass indent. <laughs> But yeah, it's it's easier than making a creature. My, my instinct on a small budget to do an ass indentation would have to be to use a, a material that is malleable, like a, a clay or something, and then basically sit on it a little bit and sit on it a little and stop motion it. <laughs> oh, I would just film it before sitting on it and then film it after sitting on it. <laughs> to show the indentation happening, I mean. That would be how I would do it, to be like, look, we're actually doing the effect of the of the sitting and it would take hours <laughs> <laughs> no probably not i don't know how many frames it would take it would be a uh, exercise <laughs> <laughs> the the monoid number two says there's no sign of life <laughs> they've just looked around for a couple of seconds the monoid number two is the monoid equivalent of ian also he has the best line coming up oh it is the best line well he says maybe the machine that told them there was life may have been wrong the implications are even more obvious and then he starts talking about 
this other thing, and he goes into a neurotic comedy routine. I don't have that written down, but is that the line that you're thinking of? I want to say it was Dodo or somebody. I was like, I don't know, I don't know how long it's going to take to get the rest of the human population down here. And he's like, oh, I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, yeah, and that's when he goes into the comedy routine of being really neurotic and a totally different character. Yeah, but she's like, wait, you're not going to... You're not planning anything, are you? And then he's like... N- no. No. <laughs> <laughs> he literally says, N- no. I thought, I assumed they were so stupid that they weren't going to catch that subtle hint that I just dropped there. Again, with the, everybody's underestimating everybody. They spy a town. I think it's just a house. The doctor returns into frame and declares he has found evidence of life. And Dodo says, it's a sort of a castle. And they go off to the sort of a castle. There's nobody there. It's surprisingly empty. Monoid is like they're hiding and start smashing shit like he's Kylo Ren or something. <laughs> Just destroying shit for attention. Just throwing a fit. Look at me! And then obvious reveal, the refusions are invisible! <laughs> what? What? He's destroying things and he has this one vase and he's getting ready to throw it and I think it's like the doctor or Steven is like, probably shouldn't do that. And he's like, I'm gonna do it! No one can stop me! I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw this vase! Like, you really probably shouldn't. What gonna? And then, like, you have the refusion. He's like, just, you know, a voice from nowhere. It's like, no, I, I really, really wouldn't. And then everyone's like, God? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very nice face, and I'd appreciate it if you put it down. The do- the doctor says, it sounds like it's it's in the room. And I was like, really? Because it sounds like, a, like an echoey voice that was added in post. They could have just had someone standing just out of frame talking. But you did, you, you don't get that bass sound. <laughs> yeah, back on the arc, Monoid 1 reveals the fission device that will kill all the humans is hidden in the statue. And Maharis, the uh, servant guy, hears it on the scanner, but he doesn't see where they point. And he tells the people in the security kitchen, but he doesn't know where the fission device is. They do eventually say that, I mean, they say that it's in the statue, but they later clarify that it's in the head of the statue. Well, that's a whole big thing. But, like, wouldn't it make more sense to put it in the thing, like, in its hands? I felt like that was the obvious place. No, because the revolution was recent, and the humans had already been building the statue, and it was after the revolution... They already got to the hands. Yeah, and it it was after that that the uh, uh, monoids built the head, and they built the fission device into it. But it did feel the same way. I was like, but he's obviously holding a bomb. In plain view, by the way. Weren't they building the statue in plain view? Yeah, but I mean, I think most of the humans are in the kitchen. Earth's destroyed, isn't it? Plain view? Isn't that a city? What? Plain view sounds like a city. What reference are you trying to make right now? Plain view sounds like the name of a city. Joe, nobody's on your page. It might be, but nobody cares. (laughs) I'm pretty sure they built it in the Ark, not in plain view. Chose in a different book. Okay, so back on the planet, the doctor is talking to the refusion, who reveals that they turned invisible because of a solar flare. Stan Lee gets his notebook. Uh, also, the the refusion is played in this scene by a guy moving the chair underneath the table. Wait, were they invisible? I thought it was implied that they, like, gave up their physical form. Yeah, but that's, I mean, they're invisible. You can't see them. They can still move shit. My question is, why would he move the chair if he didn't have a, like, was it just, like, for politeness? Like, just pretend I'm here. Basically here. Wasn't it for someone else to sit on? I don't even remember that. No, he's sitting across the table from the doctor. But he doesn't have a physical form. Like, I'm not wrong, right? He's not an, invis- an invisible being that exists. He has sort of a physical form. He can move objects. He has, like, a precision in the world. Like, he moves around and ass indentations and can move levers. and. Yeah, remember the ass indentations? Well, that's what I'm, what I'm saying. He's, he said it, not me. I don't remember him saying that. He didn't quite say that, but he did sort of wishy-washy up the concept of being invisible. And plus it comes into play later that the physical form is not entirely limited by the physical form. It's weird and inconsistent, and fuck it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, so Monoid 2 guns down uh, Yendom the human on the way back to the pod. What? Right. Why? So wait, the Desak and who were both on the planet? So there's two humans. I don't, I don't know. I think I wrote, I wrote down Yendom. No, Desak is another guy who comes on later. So this was Yendom. Okay, my my notes are all messed up because I hadn't written it down, but I had written down the the name later, and I was looking at the wrong place. So this was Yendom, not Desak. Desak shows up later. 
I mean, he's already been around, probably, but on the Ark, maybe? I don't know. So, yes, two kills him. Shoots him down. Okay, so so we're we're not at the Triple Ds yet. That's later. <laughs> Desak join, joins them later. Monoid, Monoid 2 guns down Yendam. That's the guy. Uh, on the way back to the po- pod. Eh, poid. Uh, <laughs> Monoid 2 reports back to the Ark, but the pod explodes with him inside it before he can reveal anything. I have feelings the re- the about refusion. this. The refusion. Exploded the pod, correct? A refusion did it. I don't know if it was the same refusion. The whole thing about the refusions is they sent out whatever space message they sent out that was like, hey, here's an inhabitable planet. That's why Earth is going there in the first place. And so, like, their whole thing is they're like, yeah, we don't technically physically exist, sort of, but we do a little bit. But, like, this planet should have visible life on it. I guess. They're detectable by some kind of instruments. But I mean, they want, they're like, the planet should have people here. Like, real, visible people. But we want to make sure that if they're going to live here, they're going to be peaceful. And if they're not peaceful, they can't stay. But like, the very first thing that they do is put a bomb in a pod. Yeah, that's not very peaceful. They're like, we're peaceful people. We don't even have, like, war or any of that shit. We do have just bombs lying around, and we will just throw them into pods. I don't know if it was necessarily a bomb as so much I as mean, they, he, they... he messed with it. Yeah. Yeah, he messed with the with the pod, I think. That's what the scene was earlier with the ascendantation, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he was messing with the pod and sort of rigging it to explode. But, like, that's... That doesn't seem super peaceful to me, that's all I'm saying. No, 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 it, it isn't. That's an act of terrorism. I mean, like, no one was in it, and, like, they didn't want, I guess, them to get back to the ship... Because they didn't want the monoids to come down or whatever, but... Maybe they didn't intend for the monoid to go back to the ship, to the pod. I'm just saying, it's very sketchy. At the very least, it was sabotage. That accidentally became murder. But at the most, it's it's murder. Well, I guess if if it accidentally became murder, it's not murder, it's, uh... B- m- m- well, monoid slaughter. Oh, right, yes. <laughs> Good call. Uh, that's that's pretty much the end of uh, episode three. The return! And we are now into episode four. The, the bomb. bomb! The bomb which somebody set up us. The monoids are coming to the planet, right? They decide to proceed with the plans, even though they lost contact with monoid two. Because he's like, hey guys! And they're like, well, I guess we'll just... Keep going ahead. I'm not going to take that as a bad sign. No, no, I'm sure it's fine. So the the refusions decide to wait one day before taking further action, in case the humans manage to rise up against the monoids in that time. And the monoids store their microscopic young or extra monoids. I don't know if they're young. They're more monoids in those reflective box things. And don't forget the potatoes! <laughs> Which they have the humans put in the pods. And the the monoids get in the pods, and they go to Refuses. Still thinking the humans have no idea they intend to blow the Ark up. With a 12-hour clock, by the way. Why is it so long? Why does it take the bomb so long to go off? We set it for 12 hours! Why? Like, it clearly doesn't take you half that amount of time to get to the planet. Set that shit for, like, 30 minutes tops. Well, maybe they don't have the technology to do that. It's a fission device that they've hid inside a statue head. It has limitations. It takes 12 hours to detonate. That is half a day. Maybe the clock is in day increments. So you can't set it to seconds or hours or minutes. It only has days. You can only set it to half a day. What? That's the smallest increment. They can clearly communicate from the planet to the ship. So why can't they just do a remote detonation? Because that would be harder to rig. Like, how much harder? Like, I feel like they didn't really try. Remote detonation? That's... That's tricky. From a planet to a spaceship? They're going to have to build a whole new device for that. <laughs> put, in, put in the remote detonation and use the 12-hour countdown. I mean, they as have a space travel. Safe backup. How? Remote detonation is a tricky thing, especially if you're going to a planet. They can travel through space yeah and remote detonation requires a transmitter and a receiver and you gotta rig that receiver to the actual fission device and it's it's a whole complicated mess of engineering to set up a thing that's gonna blow up so setting a timer is a lot easier and i know why it's a 12 hour timer it's because they're using one of those timers that you use for like a a, for a light to come on once a day and turn off. That's all they had lying around the spaceship. Yeah, so they're using that. And it's stuck. It's stuck so they can't set it to less than 12 hours. They can't, like, just reset it so that uh, just this time of day. It's stuck, like, at a certain position. I'm actually kind of mad because I buy that. I just made sense of it. Give me a no prize. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, in the kitchen, 
Stephen Plant makes plans to get out. They're in the kitchen. They make this plan, uh, which is a very shitty plan, which is the Monoi comes in. And they're like, hey, Monoi, come look at this. Like, this pill isn't turning into food or something <laughs> of that degree. And while the mom is like, oh, I'll give it here, one of them slips out. And then they're like, oh, we got it. It's fine. And the Monoi leaves. And then the guy that got out comes back and opens the door and lets everybody out. And then, then I, right after that, that's when the, the monoids leave and land on the planet. Then the doctor contacts Stephen. And the doctor says the arc is about to blow up. Stephen knows that. Nobody knows where the bomb is. But the doctor intends to find out. So basically this, this exchange of information exchanges no information. Nobody learns anything new. Uh, well, the doctor learns Stephen already knows as much as he already knows. That's all of the learning that happens. They learn that they all know the same stuff. The only thing that is new is that they're all on the same page, but about the stuff they already knew. And then uh, a refusion is going to go to the Ark. The Doctor suggests to the Refusion that the Refusion should take a pod back to the Ark because the Monoids won't know who did it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, re the reason why a pod needs to go back to the Ark is because the humans need to get on the Ark. And somebody has to do it. If the Doctor or Dodo does it, then the, the Monoids will know. But if someone invisible does it, then they're going to be like, who did that? Because they don't know about the invisibility thing. So it's, it's, like, it's like Star Wars again, where it's like, don't blow it up. There's nothing in it. It must have been a misfire. It's yet another moment of R2-D2 and C-3PO getting off the Star Destroyer. Except now they're going back to the Star Destroyer. And also it's not R2-D2 and C-3PO. It's an invisible guy. But it's basically the same thing. Uh, also, why didn't they just blow up the thing in Star Wars? The Star Destroyer? Because Leia is on board? No, no, no. Why didn't they blow up the escape pod? Well, they tried to, but it had a 12-hour timer on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, because the guy's like, should I blow it up? And the other guy's like, nah, that, there's no life form, so it's Okay, fine. the reason is they, want, they don't want to waste batteries. But this is, a, this is a universe that knows droids exist. There could be something on that pod. Well, maybe they haven't figured out how to use the te technology yet. Maybe the guy's new and he's like looking at it and like, oh, there's nobody in there. Who cares? Because he doesn't know that the thing doesn't detect droids and thought about that. Fair enough. So, anyway, the refusion goes to the Ark, and then the Doctor goes to the top to one. The, the Doctor and Dodo step out to join the Monoids as the pod takes off. And the Monoids go, who did that? We haven't seen anyone. And the Doctor's like, hey, neither have we, to be <laughs> completely honest. And then, like, turns to Dodo and giggles. Nobody's at all concerned with anyone seeing through their bullshit. My next note says one, Monoid one, basically reveals the statue bomb. Because nobody is good at bluffing. Yeah, no. One's like, well, does it matter? We're basically going to blow up all the humans with the bomb that we hid in the head of the statue. And the doctor's like, tee hee hee. I have some stuff before that. I have the humans on the Ark open the pod and declare it empty. The Refusion laughs at them for being so fucking stupid. The Monoids have a big meeting with Dodo and the doctor present. Monoid 1 mentions the bomb is in the statue. Good job. Like, hey, let's let's have a meeting where we reveal secret information. Should we keep the humans around and the doctor and sure, yeah, let's let's keep them around. They could come in handy. I spent that whole time thinking though, because like three comes down with one, and I spent the whole time just thinking, I wonder if three's like, hey, it can I be can I be do, two now? Do I get a scoot up or am I still just three? Because there's a hole now, and we can't just not have a two. That's weird. Just check it. And like, his his necklace is still right here. Can I have his collar? I blew up. But then everyone has to sort of He just like up. sharpies the three into a two. He uses white out to get the lower part of the three off. <laughs> Fills in the little angle. Somewhere at 65 becomes a 64. Yes. So what's next? The humans send a landing party, including Maharas. And I think there was a little moment there of, of them being like, we don't trust you, Maharas, because we think you might have been too close to the monoids. So we're going to send you. <laughs> They're basically doing the same thing, where it's like, oh, we're going to send the guy we don't really like. But they also send... Uh... No, Steven don't, doesn't get sent, because Steven and Venusa go and look for the bomb in the wrong places. The monoids start infighting and killing each other. Because some of them are like, this is stupid, right? They're, they're, like... they're afraid. I don't think... Some of them don't trust their fusion. They're like, I don't like it. Let's just go back to the ship and live on the ship. Yeah, let's just go back to the ship. That's going to blow up. Which I think is is how we get the reveal, isn't it? Where he's like, what are you going to do? Just go back to the ship where the bomb is? And the other one's like, ah, oh, shit. Yeah, we're going to go back to the ship where the bomb is. Well, we've got 
what, six hours at this point, we'll be fine. We'll just turn it off. The pod returns with the human landing party, and Maharas wanders off. This is where my Mad Max reference is. Have you seen Fury Road, first of all? Yes. yes. I'm going to say spoiler warning to any listeners who haven't yet. This is a small, small spoiler warning, because it's not really a huge moment, and it's a bit of a cliche. In any story with slaves in it, there's usually one who has Stockholm Syndrome and wants to desperately wants to go back to the Masters. Tries to do so and instantly gets killed for it by the Masters, usually, or by accident. This happens in Mad Max with one of the, well, with the pregnant person. She instantly dies, almost. This is one of those things that keep happening in stories with slaves trying to get away from the masters. There's usually one who tries to go back and gets killed. And uh, that happens here. Maharis gets uh, shot. Didn't something like that happen in um, Django Unchained as well? It's been a while since I saw it, but I think... It's just one of those things that keep popping up in these kinds of stories. It's weird. Yeah, it's like it's it's a story beat that's apparently been around since at least the sixties. It's the only life they've ever known. It's one of those things that's very sort of it's it's resonant, but it's been done so many times that you start to go, I've seen this before. <laughs> While the monoids fight each other, the remaining humans sneak out and run off. This is when Dasuk has been written down here by me. He manages some fucking how to trick the monoid guarding the doctor and Dodo to go help monoid one. He's like, monoid one needs help. And he just fucking falls for it. Even Instead of going, wait, why is this human on the planet now? Instead, he's like, oh, I better go help monoid one. He has no hesitation. He's just like, I- yeah, all right. Yeah, that's what I do now. That's I better go help the leader because this weird human who is not supposed to be here said so. He's supposed to be in the security kitchen. Something's not right, but I don't care. I'm gonna go help Monoid One. So Dasuk, the Doctor, and Dodo decide to go tell the other humans where the bomb is. The Monoids are still fighting each other, and one Monoid seems to be tired of it. Yeah, one Monoid is like, starts crying almost, and like drops the gun. It's like... (laughs) What the fuck am I doing? He's the fan. Yeah, except he's he just shot a guy. Instead of doing it before shooting a guy, he's like, oh, I just shot a guy. I'm done. This isn't fun anymore. I think he's the last survivor of this particular fight. And then the 3Ds, which are now the actual 3Ds, not the 2Ds and a Y. The 3Ds get back to the pod, and something amazing happens. The doctor says, fly us back, I'll contact Steven, and then it fucking dissolves to later. <laughs> we get... Actual time compression (laughs) in a classic Doctor Who episode. This is revolutionary storytelling. (laughs) The Doctor says, do this, I'll do this, and then it dissolves to those things having already been done. Instead of having to watch them do those things that they just said they were going to do, and then seeing the end result of it, we see them deciding to do it, and then the aftermath of it. Somebody discovered editing! It truly is a Christmas miracle. It's amazing. I didn't even think about that, but it is awesome. (laughs) I, I was like, what?! This feels like actual television. Like, they figured out how to tell stories. What is happening? This show, they f- figured out pacing. I, I kind of was confused for a second. I was like, whoa, we're not going to see that? See, Where are we now? I'm confused. <laughs> I didn't see that happen. What? Wait, wait. Are we are we actually dissolving to later? Like, while it was dissolving, I was, like, super excited. Like, is this going to actually have already happened? Yeah. Wow, cool. I do remember that that serial ended and we both were like, huh, that felt like watching a, or like almost a current episode of Doctor Who, like as far as pace goes. Yeah, they really, they really figured out the pacing right at the end, probably because they were like, oh shit, we're over. We're going to have to c- cut some stuff. Those scenes probably existed. They filmed them. <laughs> they just didn't make it. So the humans on the Ark are like, we can't get into the statue. Already establishing that they have found out that it's in the statue. Like, we're cutting to them knowing that it's in the statue. And they can't get in there. And the refusion voice is like, clear the main deck. I'll take it from here. And we have, like, a really nice shot where it's, like, walking towards the uh, the statue and everybody sort of, like, Steps to the side. I like that shot. But the shot that's about to happen Mm. suddenly reveals how small the model of the statue actually is. It gets lifted quite far off the floor. By the refusion. And then suddenly... It looks tiny. And he moves the statue out of the airlock using the force. Throws it into space. And it explodes in, in space. space. And it dissolves to later again. We get another dissolve. Somebody figured out how to use the dissolve crank. I imagine it's a crank. 
We need another to solve. Okay. It is like very obvious that they recently acquired a switcher because I think the first time you notice they use it is uh, the chase because the the Dalek screens are like it's like it's one camera shot circle wiped inside of another one <laughs> and like ever since then you have been seeing more more of that kind of thing. Every time I see it, I'm like, yay. <laughs> This is probably brand new. <laughs> brand new. State of the art special effects. <laughs> oh, it's technically visual effects, I guess. Let's hope this becomes a habit. If if we can get more dissolves to later of like, we know what's going to happen, dissolve to it having happened, or we don't know that it's going to happen, it happens, and then we don't reference the fact that it happened. Like, those are the two ways to do a thing happening. You either set it up and then show the aftermath, or you show it and then don't linger on it. So the humans are all on refuses, planning to move in, making friends with the refusion, who demands they make peace with the monoids. This is when the, the refusion really takes on the god role. That he's so destined to be by the voice. Yeah, it's very obvious this guy's going to be the god of this planet. I have some serious problems with that, which is mostly that I don't feel like I would move into a planet inhabited by... That has by a god a- on it? I mean, that's that's kind of where I'm going. Yeah, me, me too. I wouldn't want to live on a planet with a god on it. Quite glad that I don't. <laughs> I don't think I would move into a planet that's mostly inhabited by invisible beings. Your privacy is out the window. Right. It's a little unclear to me whether there is one refusion or multiple refusions or whether this one refusion is all of the refusions who have become this one invisible being. Again, the force. It's like it's like a force ghost. It's like it's like George Lucas watched this serial and was like, I could use this. They become one with the force. At any rate, what if this is just of... one refusion who's who's decided all this, and then they they move in, and then like the real refusions come in, and like you listen to Carl? Fuck Carl! <laughs> He's a jerk. He's a village idiot. I mean, <laughs> you have to question the motivations of like either beings or a being. He's like, hey, I feel like this planet should be inhabited by other people that I can see that can't see me, and then invites them all over. Like, that's suspect. And this has been a story about different beings enslaving each other. And this is a being who is clearly superior to these these guys in, in terms of what he can do. Like, this guy is clearly more powerful than the monoids and the humans... <laughs> Actually, I had to think for a moment before I thought of humans uh, <laughs> combined. Yeah. It seems like this is a perfect setup for a sequel serial where, like, 700 years later, humans and monoids have all been enslaved by refusions. I'd watch that. History repeats itself. So Team Tardis fucks off. Not before they they sort of further cement their legendary status. That's after they fuck off. Because the humans talk about how their children might think this is a legend. So they record some footage of the Tardis dissolving. Can't fake that, obviously. (laughs) They don't have a switcher. (laughs) So back on the Tardis? Dodo changes her, her clothes. Into some 60s looking clothing? I think her outfit was pretty neat. I liked it. It looked like something off like a, a, a 60s pop TV thing. Like Top of the Pops type of thing where people are dancing around to some pop band. Looked like that kind of clothing. I thought it was cute. <sighs> Probably leftovers from another show. I just thought of something that irritates me. The doctor in canon has this ginormous wardrobe full of what must be a bunch of different clothes since companions of like whatever size or gender and yet steals things all the time so he's got this shit but he steals it anyway i think the thing is this is when they establish that wardrobe that has not been canon earlier has it? Have they ever referenced it before? So maybe he just found it. Maybe Dodo found it. Maybe the doctor had no idea that he had a fucking huge wardrobe and he's like, oh shit, I've been stealing clothes all this time and I had a wardrobe somewhere in the TARDIS? I didn't know that. That is the most true thing I've ever heard. Or he's just been slowly stealing clothes and throwing them in this one TARDIS closet and be like, that's the wardrobe now. Also, to be fair, uh, most of the times I feel like when he was stealing clothes, they were, for some reason or another, locked out of the TARDIS or very far from the TARDIS. I still I still kind of like the idea of the Doctor not knowing he had a wardrobe until Dodo found it. Because that, that, that would seem so in line with, like, modern who. This isn't the first instance of the wardrobe, though, because... 
in um, the Trojan uh, serial, Vicky goes into the wardrobe trying to find something to put on before she exits the TARDIS. And then uh, Stephen and the Doctor use it as well in a, the last episode. But what about way back in Edge of Destruction? Doesn't he get a, a coat oh, yeah. for Ian and Barbara? Ian and Barbara get a coat, uh, yeah, at the end of the... I mean, I don't, th- no, I don't know that. if they yeah. say yeah. that it came from the wardrobe or whatever, if there's any reference made to it specifically. But he does go into the TARDIS and, and come... Fi- yeah, comes out with a coat, finds it. Although it is huge. I remember Ian's coat being like a little bit too big. Also, maybe it's just quicker and easier if they're just like, let's just still close instead of like hunting through this wardrobe. Right, we know they're period acceptable because they're from here. It's actually just laziness. Let's power through the end here. So the doctor sneezing and dissolving. The editor seems to have taken this effect a little too much. And then he disappears and then just absolutely refuses to believe it has anything to do with the refusion. God help me. And the, the, the dissolving is really, it's gone too far. Now, now they've dissolved the doctor. That's just, that's just one dissolve too many. <laughs> but that, that's it. That's the end of the bomb and the end of the arc. We did it. We did Yay! it. Yay! We did another episode. Final thoughts! Is it time for final thoughts? I guess so. You did the thing. I did the thing. So, Tony. Yes. You want to start us off, off with your final thoughts? You go first, then Vince, then me. I don't know. I always just repeat your final thoughts. I know. That's why you said you wanted to go first. I know, but I normally take that time to be like, what am I going to say? And then like you slowly take it. But now I don't have that time. I just feel pressure. Uh, it was good. I think I've already said this, but I enjoyed the pacing of it. I was thoroughly entertained the whole time. And at no point was I like, oh, God. I wonder how much of it is that the pacing of this uh, serial was really good and how much of it was that it's the first one that exists that we've had in a while. I really liked the design of the monoids. I thought they were great. Uh, I don't know. Come back to me. All right, Vince. (laughs) Final thoughts! I thought I was going to be after you, but okay. I forgot the order. So my... (laughs) Final thought. I think this was a a pretty good serial. I I there were some things that were stupid, like really really stupid, and I have mentioned them. But overall, I thought it was it was mostly entertaining. It was pretty well paced, especially toward the end when they figured out you can dissolve to later. So so I I, I really like that. That this seems to be the serial where they figured out oh you can actually do storytelling by skipping ahead. So that was cool. I kind of thought it was it was it was interesting that they handled the the subject of history repeating itself and slavery and I thought some of it was well handled and some of it was not well handled. Some of it seemed like like it was kind of really ham-handed and almost insulting to to the idea of progress but i thought there were some 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 interesting points made in the serial and i think some of those points were made in in kind of clever ways and some of them were not so i think this was kind of a mixed bag but mostly i thought it was a a very watchable serial i did kind of zone out a couple of times and had to skip back and and recheck a couple of things but overall i i i kind of liked it i thought it had pretty good flow to it joe's final thoughts (laughs) um I feel like this is the closest we've had to like a modern day two parter. I've already I've already mentioned that, but yeah, like it's split in half nicely. Uh, I really like that midpoint cliffhanger of we're seven hundred years in the future and like how everything sort of flipped. I do like that a lot. I feel like it broke up the serial into halves nicely. What about the time meddler? Wasn't that a bit like uh, modern? Because to me, that was a very well paced piece. This one more specifically feels like a two-parter to me. Yeah, that that one might have felt more like an episode, even though it was also four episodes, so it was the same length. Yeah, but this one has, like, a very definite There's a definite, half point. Yeah, yeah, middle. You know? It's like, you know, the first half is, you know, this story, and the second half is 700 years later. I really like that that idea. I, I do. I also like the monoids. I didn't care for their collars that much. They looked really cheap and also inconsistent about how it was used. I did enjoy this episode a lot. I thought the pace was great. I thought the design was for everything was pretty cool. The, the arc itself looked nice. I didn't really care for the refusions that much. I, it felt like just another thing tacked on of just, oh, it's invisible. And we've done invisible like so many times before. Could have been something different or just not have people on the planet. I don't, I don't know. But uh, all in all, I think it held up for the most part. And I, and I like the fact that the Doctor sort of becomes a legend for the first time. I don't know if, if it's good because it's the first serial we've watched in a while that exists, but I feel like it's the best one we've watched. 
probably since the Trojan one, which is weird because the Trojan one doesn't exist. But I think this is this is we haven't pretty solid. had. I mean, this is almost going to sound too harsh, but I feel like we haven't had solid. Not solid characters, but maybe solid relationships mm-hmm. or enough of them to kind of ground you when you can't see what's going on. The Trojan episode, you, I feel like you know the characters enough to be like, I know what's going on here. Whereas I feel like ever since... The Alex Master Plan? Yeah, it's been kind of... I've said this before, I, I like Steven and I like the Doctor, but I feel like just the two of them aren't enough. And especially the uh, St. Bartholomew's Eve, Steven's mostly by himself. Or characters who you've never really seen, don't know anything about, so it's hard to kind of keep track of them when they're just audio, if you're me. Or I think when you have, you know, more of a core team who are doing things, there are more people who you can, like, picture in your head, if that makes sense. It's easier for you to keep track of of what's going on and kind of imagine it and follow through. Because you already have an idea of who everyone is and you're not spending a, a bunch of time going, wait, who is that? I just learned his name five seconds ago and now he's doing stuff and I don't know and I can't see him. It was really hard to keep track of names of characters in general in this episode because there was to suck and yeah, something and ma ma <laughs> At least the, the monoids were numbered. I, di- I did have another observation about the monoids. They are kind of generic. Not in the design. In the design, they're like, they're, they're an interesting design. They're attributes other than the fact that they don't uh they don't speak they they have first uh the sign language thing and then the machines other than that they don't really have any particular attributes they're just kind of people who look different which is fair enough but they they don't have like any special abilities like a lot of the iconic doctor who creatures tend to have like they tend to have some attribute that makes them like that you that you can bring them back for i can't really imagine seeing the the invasion earth of of the monoids like it's not going to be monoids invasion earth that's not going to happen because there's nothing really that interesting about the monoids in particular other than how they communicate to be fair though i don't think the monoids I don't think the monoids are set up to be a villain. Well, no, yeah, they're not. They're they're set up to be characters in this story. As but they could just as well be anything. They could just be people wearing mustaches. Like it could be any. There's there's nothing established about them. Yeah, there's nothing that sets them apart from any other generic uh, Doctor Who creatures. It's it's not like it's not like they can shape shift or or walk through walls or or have some particular point of view that is like theirs. They're not like like the Daleks who function certain ways and have certain ideas and are basically always the same with some slight variation and they're not like uh, the meddling monk who's you know got certain things that he likes to do and they're they're not like the cybermen who have certain abilities and they're not like like any of these recurring characters obviously the meddling monk not such a recurring character but he could have been and i don't think these guys could have been uh, a recurring character other than if you did the sequel to this serial that i talked about earlier the refusion recursion that would be the title of it <laughs> where the refusion is the villain and these guys are once again the the slaves and the humans are also slaves so they're they're all slaves to the refusion god basically and then you could do a whole thing in if they did that in modern who then you could have a thing where at first it just seems like there's a planet where there's a god and there's these humans and there's these one-eyed hairy guys and you don't even reference them by name because their names are forgotten generations ago like this is 700 years later they're not even called the monoids anymore and maybe they have longer hair now so they're just these kind of mountains of hair with an eyeball they don't even have to look the same they just are these creatures and there are humans and they're all enslaved by this god and then you get to tell a story about that like that could be an interesting episode but as for like being recurring creatures in any other kind of story there's not really that much you can do with the monoids other than anything you can do anything with the monoids basically because they're so generic that should be a recurring feature on this podcast how would this translate to modern who because we've done that a handful of times and you just did it right then oh yeah like how how bring backable are these these characters slash planets slash themes that's a catchy title How bring backable? That's the catchy title, right? I have one more thought, and it's that I'm very hopeful for Dodo, even though I like, like I believe it's been said, I, we don't think she sticks around very long. I enjoyed her a lot. 
Like, if she didn't do yeah. much besides uh, make everyone sick by sneezing, she just does what she wants and doesn't pay attention to anything at all. Nothing really seems to phase her. I respect that. The thing is, in Modern Who, she would, like Ian, be the first to die. Because she doesn't listen to the Doctor. And if you don't listen to the Doctor, you're dead. At least uh, until more recently. I guess, I guess un- I'm guess i thinking mainly under uh, Davis that, that would have been the case. Under Moffat, it would probably be different. Because he's got a different approach. Well, Donna doesn't listen to the Doctor. I guess that's true. Yeah, but I mean, things didn't work out great for her. <laughs> That's true That's also. True. <laughs> that is also true. That's also true. Well, uh, next next time we well, will be back with the Celestial Toy Maker, which is missing. We will have special guest Chris Cherry will return for that one. It'll be his first missing serial. That's exciting. Not the missing serial, but the fact that Chris Cherry is back on the show. <laughs> that yeah. is exciting. That's exciting. And he's going to have to watch something that doesn't exist. But uh, next next time we'll be back with the Celestial Toy Maker. Uh, thanks for listening to the Watch of the and uh, we are going to leave you with... Um, as promised. As promised. It's short. With uh, Vince's Chumbly remix. And uh, stay tuned after that. We have a special announcement about the winner of the stickers. So stay tuned for that. As per request. Oh, look, it's got a sort of Chumbly movement. Chumbly? Yes, you know, what a sort of... Chumley Remix by Vincent E.L. You can follow him on Twitter at Vincent E.L. And he's on SoundCloud at Vincent E.L. Swinglish.new. You can find all of his stuff there, I believe. And uh, now now the time has come to uh, yes. choose the winner of the Doctor Who stickers designed by Ray Friesen of RayFriesen.com. Uh, who, by the way, was just recently announced is going to be doing Discworld graphic novel Small I'm Gods. excited. We helped them that. Yeah, we helped a little bit, some of that. But we helped. Do I need to do a drum roll? Yeah, do a drum roll. We've got uh, names on post-it notes, <laughs> and I'm shuffling them as we speak. They're sticking to each other because they're sticky notes. And right. now I'm going to let Tony pick one. Oh, but I'm doing a drum roll. Drum roll done. I want this one. You Not drum- that one. Not this one? Okay. Who won? Loving Nico. Loving Dash Nico. You won. <laughs> you won the stickers. Congratulations. We will send those to you. Get a set of, there's like two of them, two different uh, sets. And they got all sorts of cool locations on them. They're like travel stickers. If you'd like to message us and we will get those details sorted. So we can send them to you. Congratulations! Thanks for entering. You win. And thanks to everybody else for entering. We'll try to do more stuff like this in the future. Yeah, we will do more stuff like this. Well, we would like to do more giveaways. So if you'd like to follow us on... If you're listening to us on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to us at, we announce stuff like this on our website. So if you want to follow us at... WatchYourRassalon.com. That's one R. And our Tumblr... I mean, that is our Tumblr, but it's uh, rasslonwatchathon.tumblr.com also works. So follow us there. You can follow us on Twitter, where we will also announce where we do more giveaways or any promotional things. And that's at Watch Your Rass. <laughs> watch Your Rass. Yes. Your, how many R? It's one R, right? I actually think it's two R's in that situation. <laughs> oh, we got to have some better brand awareness. Okay. Yeah. But yes, follow us on Twitter and on Tumblr and keep an eye out for more giveaways because this was fun and we'll definitely be doing more things. And I'd like to say again, thanks to Ray Friesen of RayFriesen.com for donating those stickers for the giveaway. And thanks to Vincent E.L. for being in this episode. And we look forward to uh, seeing you next time when we watch the Celestial Toy Maker with Chris Cherry. Thanks for listening to the Watchathon of Rassilon! Mm-hmm. Okay, bye.